everybody. Uh, I'm Vivek Saraswath. I'm a product manager on the Docker Data Center team, but I play an ops guy in keynotes. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about Docker for Ops, operationalizing your apps in production. It's a bit of a mouthful. Basically, we're going to show you some considerations for what it would mean to run a Docker application in production. Uh, and then Evan Hazlitt will, will come up and will give a demo of Docker Data Center, including a sneak peek at some of the new things happening with UCP, Universal Control Plane, and Docker Trusted Registry running on the new Engine 1.12. Uh, so I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. Here's a quick agenda of what we're going through today. Uh, first, we're going to talk about what it means to deliver apps with containers as a service. I think a lot of the folks touched upon this in the keynote. But really the idea is, before you actually build your app for production, you need to have a production platform that you can actually uh, use for delivering those applications. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means and the personalities that are involved. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some considerations for running a Docker app in production. And finally, Evan's going to put it all in practice with a Docker data center demo. So let's start with delivering apps with containers as a service. Like I said, you have to start with what's the platform that you're actually going to use to deliver your applications in an agile and efficient manner. So it really starts with the personalities involved. So this is the folks from Silicon Valley. That's Dinesh, that's Guilfoyle, representational. Uh, if you look at the main personas in an enterprise application environment, they are the developers and the IT operations folks, just like you saw on stage at the keynote today. Developers are really looking for agility. It's about innovation at speed. It's about being able to do faster and easier application deployment. And the Docker tools really made this a lot easier. Package up all your application dependencies in one nice little container that takes care of all your details and push that anywhere. On the other hand, your IT operations folks are looking for standardized and secure workflows. They're looking for how they can control the environment and react to all these changing needs on the developer side, but do so in a way that's easy to manage in a scalable environment. Finally, you got your business guys who are saying, look, this needs to work in every sort of environment. In an enterprise scenario, you might have a public cloud. You might have on-prem data centers. You might have multiple data centers in different ge geographical regions. You might have individual testing laptops. How do you ensure that all of your code works across all of these environments? So th these are some of the key things that people are trying to figure out in an enterprise context. So then what exactly is containers as a service? The official definition is an IT ops managed and secure environment for developers to self-service build and deploy applications. Yeah, let's take that in plain English. And to me, it really just means two things. Developers get the tools that they want, and IT gets secure and standardized workflows. So why use CAST, then? What are, what's the advantage of using containers as a service? Let's go back to some of those value propositions we were talking about earlier. Developers are really looking for agility, that innovation at speed. So what does CAST provide for that? It's a solution that has to be a solution that's easy to set up and use, uh, has Docker-native tools that developers are used to using, and extends the developer experience that people are already comfortable with. That allows them to move quickly. How about portability, working across all environments? That means you need a consistent API that works across all platforms, in this case, the Docker API. You need a seamless dev to production workflow. Whether you're running on a developer laptop all the way through to a production data center, you need to make sure that your application still works. And you need infrastructure and network and storage portability. So all your resources, whether it's running on a local laptop or let's say you've got a crazy block storage backend for your data center, you need to make sure that all of those work against your, uh, against your application. So that's portability. And then the final thing is what IT operations is looking for, and that's control. So this includes things like being able to manage in a high-scale environment, integrated content trust, ensuring that you know exactly where that code comes from and that's tracked along the entire process, uh, secure access control, knowing who has access to which resources, like the business guy in the demo, making sure that only certain people are able to access those resources, what level of access is that, and then finally, enterprise integrations. You might have LDAP, Active Directory backends. You might have your own external certificate authorities. You need to make sure that you can interface with all of those in your system. So that's what we're looking to do with containers as a service. Now, I know that we walked through this in the keynote, so I'll, I'll move through this pretty quickly. But we try to break this up into a build, ship, and run interface. So it actually really starts with ship. Ship is where your IT operations and developers collaborate. IT operations creates a base image or a series of trusted base images that they maintain. Developers then bring those images to their, their laptops or workstations or their environments, build their applications on top of those, push them back to the ship repository. 
And then finally, IT operations takes those applications and runs them in their production or test environments. And those could be in the cloud, or they could be in an on-prem environment. So a little quick touch on Docker Data Center. Uh, this is Docker's cast for enterprise. Uh, I think we already talked through most in the keynote, so I'll be quick. It starts with a Docker engine, commercially supported container runtime that includes orchestration, networking volumes, and then any plugins. Uh, the repository for the ship phase is Docker Trusted Registry. That's where the image management and distribution happens. That's where security, uh, the IT operations and the developers can securely collaborate. And then Docker Universal Control Plane, the product I manage, that's the run side. That's where you actually run your applications in a test or production environment. And across all of these tools, you have security in the form of content trust through things like image signing with, Docker, with uh, Notary, uh, the scanning service we talked about in the keynote demo, a role-based access control, and connections with your enterprise LDAP or Active Directory authentication. And then outside of the data center box are a ton of different ecosystem integrations, different OSs, CI/CD platforms, images networking volumes, config management tools, monitoring and logging. And this all sits on a number of different infrastructures, whether you're running in the public cloud, whether you're running on an on-premise data center, or whether you're running or a virtualized environment like vSphere, or whether you're running in a physical hyper or hyperconverged environment on bare metal. So the goal with Docker Data Center is to provide you with a series of tools you need to build this containers as a service, integrate on top of whatever platform you're actually running, and then make sure that you can integrate with ecosystem, uh, different ecosystem vendors across the entire uh, container world. OK, moving right along, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are some considerations for actually running a Docker application in production. This list is by no means exhaustive, but we'll go through a couple of different things and then talk about how the Docker CAS solution helps to solve these problems. And uh, Evan's going to run through after that a series of, uh, he's going to show an application that he built and give you an idea of how you can build a production application and then run it in, that, uh, in UCP. So a couple of areas to consider for a production application. How do you build for scale? Anyone in enterprise knows that you've got a ton of different data centers, you have a ton of different public clouds. How do you ensure that things run in a scalable environment? Security, things like access control, things like content trust, we'll talk through some of those pieces. Monitoring, how do you see when a problem is happening with your containers? How do you understand statistics for a distributed application and then use that to troubleshoot your applications in production? And then finally, ecosystem. How do you actually integrate with all the different components that you probably use across your really disparate infrastructure? So let's start with scale. Uh, if you're at DockerCon, you've probably heard the term microservices at least once. Uh, but a microservice application is just a, an application built off of a series of loosely coupled services, which can be swapped out independently and rapidly updated. So you might have a static website, databases, front end, queues, API endpoint. And these can all be swapped out and used uh, in, a, in a number of different environments. So when you're building a microservice, you need to make sure that it works across anything from your developer laptop to whatever VMs you might be running in a public cloud to whatever production data centers you're using. So this is part of the solution that we try to build with CAS. You use the Docker API. It's very easy to build microservices that run in a number of different environments. The next part about scale, it's not just the application. It's also your infrastructure. How do you ensure that your infrastructure is highly available? That means that if something goes wrong you know, and, and there's a problem in the data center, how do you ensure that your cluster stays alive? How do you ensure that all the infrastructure you're running keeps on going and all your applications are unaffected? Downtime is the worst, right? So that's what HA infrastructure is all about. With Docker Data Center, we do this through a couple of different ways. Uh, universal Control Plane, where you actually run the application, has HA in the form of its controllers. You can spawn multiple UCP controllers, uh, three, five, or seven. Uh, the, more you, the more controllers you have, the more failures you can tolerate. So if you have three controllers, you can tolerate one, one of them going down. Five controllers, you can tolerate two of them going down, et cetera. Uh, and the trade-off, of course, is that the more controllers you create, uh, the, the slower the performance might be because you're replicating all that information across various parts of the, of the cluster. So that's how UCP stays alive. DTR, Docker Trusted Registry, has its own HA, separate from UCP. So you can create multiple DTR replicas, and that ensures that if one goes down, the registry remains active. And the final thing, and I didn't put this on the slide, is what we call container HA. Uh, with Swarm, if one of your containers goes down, the health check service, the integrated health check service checks against it and automatically re restarts it on another node. So that way, you have all your bases covered. You have your production workloads uh, are, are kept highly available, your registry is highly available, and your actual applications themselves are highly available. So let's talk a little bit about access control. 
In the keynote demo, I showed a very, very quick uh, view of this using the permissions and labels. I gave the view only label to the business guy so that he could inspect the service, but he couldn't actually make any changes. So how does that actually work in practice? You set up your authentication through either a built-in auth or whatever enterprise integration you might use, like an LDAP backend. Then you can set up users, and you can make users a part of teams. With those teams, you can uh, assign a certain level of permission to different labels. Those labels can then be applied to an application. So we had that voting app application. We applied the DockerCon label to it. And then we said, we'll give the business guy, business team, view only access to that label. That way, they couldn't make any changes. So the different forms of, uh, of permissions that you have in UCP, no access means you can't see or touch anything. View only means you can inspect the containers, LS them, but you can't actually make changes. Restricted control is what you might want to use in a production environment. So you can create, run containers, restart them, stop, delete them. But you can't actually do any privileged operations. That's what full control is. So being able to exec into a container and make production changes, uh, being able to access different in namespaces, uh, having access to the kernel, being able to do host-mounted volumes or privileged containers, that's something, that's something you give to someone with full control. And then finally, the admin is the one who can actually make changes to the system, create new users, and set permissions. So an example you might give is, you might give your engineering team the ability to do full control of the application. You might give the security team that's monitoring the applications just view-only access. Uh, and then you give your admins, the people actually running your UCP and DTR environments, the ability to do everything. The other part of security is not just what's going on in the cluster, it's also providing integrated content trust. We show this a lot in the keynote, but the idea here is that you want to have a series of base images that your developers can trust and use, and then when they build their applications, you know as the IT operations guy that you can trust the image that was created, that it was created by them, and that it's free of any errors. How do we do that? So the first thing is a tool called Image Signatures. This is used to the open source Notary platform and enforced in the Docker data center through the Docker Content Trust feature. This means that when you push to the registry, the image is automatically signed with a personal key of whoever wrote, created that application. So that way, as an IT operations folk, you know exactly which developer created that image. And this is already running in Hub now, uh, so you can see which images are signed in Docker Hub Online. When you're actually running your own on-premise environment, you can control who has that level of access. The next thing, and we show this in the keynote, is image scanning. So the Docker scanning service scans through all the layers in an image and checks all the components against known CVE databases so you can see any errors. Once you discover those errors, you can take them back to the developers, fix the errors, bring them back. You know you now have an application that's free of any issues. Then when you actually push the applications into production, just make sure that the images that you use are, are frequently updated and you rebuild the containers off of the newest version of the image. Now you have production applications that are free of any errors, and you know exactly who developed them and where they came from. Next thing we're going to talk about is monitoring, so analytics and troubleshooting. So most people, have people here heard of the cattle versus pets analogy? Yes? No? OK. Um, the idea here is basically cattle are, uh, pets are applications where you try to keep the application alive as easily as possible. It's a single instance that might be running in a VM. It might contain state with itself. You do everything you can to keep that specific, that specific instance alive, you, high availability, et cetera. In a cattle world, this is more like microservices. You have a number of different containers, for example, that are running that application. If one goes down, you just spawn up a new one, and you load balance appropriately. That way, you can ensure that you don't see any single points of failure in an application. But monitoring in a cattle environment is very different. If a single instance goes down in a cattle environment, you don't necessarily care. What you care about is the actual application going down as a whole. So you need more specialized tools for ensuring that you're actually monitoring the entire microservice application and not just the individual instances. So we, we do this a couple of different ways. Within the CASP Docker Data Center platform, we can do quick analysis to things like application statistics or doing syslog integration so you can actually see debugging happen in real time. But if you really want more sophisticated analysis, this is where we say go out to the ecosystem. There's a series of open source tools, and I think uh, Evan's going to show some of them, things like Influx and Prometheus. Or there's a ton of different partner partners who are working on really, really smart solutions around monitoring and troubleshooting. Which brings me to my last slide. Uh, and this is uh, really about technology partner integration. So you have, we, have, we have a ton of different uh, ecosystem partners in a number of different areas. They are certified to run on the Docker Data Center platform. And if you're on this list, then uh, we have tested it, and it works against the platform. There's a number of different areas where that might come up. 
We talked about portability, uh, portability of networking and storage infrastructure. So all these folks on the networking storage side are working on or have plugins that plug into the Docker environment. So for networking, you have companies like Cisco, Aristo, Weave. On the storage side, all the way from public cloud things like AWS, uh, all the way to folks like ClusterHQ and Portworx are building plugins that allow you to handle storage. We all know storage is a pretty tough problem to solve. And then on the logging and monitoring side, we've got a lot of different partners who integrate into their back end so you can see the statistics happen in real time uh, and then make the changes that you need to do. So folks like Splunk, Sysdig, Logly, uh, these all have done really great work in this area. Uh, so uh, this is actually my last slide. So just a quick thing on getting started with Docker Cast Solutions. You can learn more about Docker Data Center at the following link, or just go to the main page and find Docker Data Center. You can get a 30-day trial of uh, Docker Data Center or purchase it from the new Docker store that was announced today, store.docker.com. Or just come talk to us at the Docker Data Center booth. We, we love to talk and learn more about your use cases and applications. So now I'm going to go over to the fun part. Let's talk, uh, hand it over to Evan, who's going to show us a demo of how you can actually build a production application using microservices and then run it in an environment like UCP. Thanks. Uh, yes, so hello. My name is Evan Hazlett. I'm a software engineer at Docker working on UCP. So as Vivek said, um, he laid out a lot of different things um, that we need to do in order to operationalize our applications in production. So we're going to touch on those as we go through and then show an actual uh, a more complex application. So if we log in to UCP, um, so uh, another thing to note is this is our next, uh, the next version coming out. We built this completely on Docker 1.12. So um, all of the features that you saw uh, yesterday and, and throughout today, um, they're, they're, we're building right on top of that. We stand on the shoulders of giants. So um, the first thing we talked about uh, was security. Right? We need access control. We need to know uh, authentication. We want to be able to, to log in um, and know where things are going and where they come from. So what UCP gives us um, is the ability to authenticate against Active Directory LDAP as well as a managed mode. And as Vivek pointed out, um, we need the ability to control access to different things in the system. So if we look at user management uh, in Universal Control Plane, we can see here that I have several users um, and, and teams. And Vivek laid this out, but we're going we're gonna to dive in a little bit here. So I have a DB team, and, and this team has a couple members. And if we look at the permissions in this, we can see that there's a, there's a resource label and a, and a permission. Now, the way that permissions work in UCP is one of the core design principles we have is we want, we want simplicity. We want things easy to use, but yet powerful, um, if, you do, if you choose to. So we use a loose construct of labeling to where we can tie resources together um, and, and build either something as simple or as complex as you want uh, to, to control your access. So in here, this team, which is the DB team, has full control. However, if I look at the application team and the application users, um, they only have view-only access to this. So we'll, we're going to actually see how this works. So in UCP, we, uh, the next version here, we, we're, we're fully leveraging services in the new Docker 1.12. So we're going to quickly deploy here to show off um, the access control, and then we'll revisit this to dive in a little deeper. So um, as you saw in the keynote, there's two ways to launch here. We can either use the bundle or we can use the form wizard. Today, so we can highlight kind of the actual uh, lower level bits, we're going to go and just use, go ahead and use the form. So I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to deploy Redis. And here I'm going to tell it what label I want to use. So since I want to deploy, um, I want to actually test uh, and show the, the DB access control, I'm going to specify that label. Now, once we send this back, um, it'll resolve or it'll reconcile the declaration, spins up the container, and now I have this. So if we go and look at the services, we can see I have one service running and ready to go. Now, I'm currently logged in as an admin, so I'm going to log out and log in as an application user. Now, you notice the dashboard is different. We, um, another core design uh, for UCP is visibility. We want to be able to see everything that's in your, your infrastructure and, and deploy it out through your cluster. However, but we also want to do, uh, make it visible to the context you're in. So here I'm an application user. I don't have all the bells and whistles uh, and all the settings. But um, I have access to the resources, and I can see exactly what, is, uh, what the administrator has set up uh, for me to see. So here I have the, the, the database service. I can see that. I can't see anything else. And if I try to go and do an operation on this, we'll dive in a little bit to tell uh, exactly what these features are. But we can see that I have access denied. And so this just shows the, the, kind of the tip of the iceberg of what you can accomplish with the role-based access control um, in Universal Control Plane. Now, access to, to the runtime resources in Universal Control Plane is, is very important. However, we also need the same thing for our registry. 
So if we look at the Docker Trusted Registry, we have a very similar look and feel. So here I have a team uh, named Stark, and I have a couple users in there, and these have different, different access. We also have control um, to, to, similar to how we use labeling, we have uh, repositories. So here I have um, a Docker demo repo, and I'm saying that the members of this team only have read-only access to this. And you can, this allows you to control who gets to push the content. So Universe Control Plane handles the, the container runtime, like how you're actually running. And DTR is the other side that says, whatever's pushed in, uh, we want to make sure that it's, it's signed, uh, where is it coming from, who did it, and make sure they have access to store it there. So then when you bring it across the run, um, it's actually what, you, what it should be. So that's great. We touched on some security, uh, access control. Now we want to move into the, one of the, the next topic that Vivek talked about, which was scalability. So in, in the old days, uh, a whole you know, two months ago, um, we used to run containers one-off, right? So we'd have probably most of us. Uh, I'm a long-time ops guy. I know I have a, a, a ton of horrible bash scripts um, that, that I use to manage things. Um, we, we launch these one-off containers, and we worry about, all right, well, what do we do when we scale? We've got all these things to, to deploy these things out. We need to make sure that, you know, when we deploy new versions, that we do these in tandem. Um, and Docker 1.12 helps us not have to worry about those type of problems. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the new services a little bit. Now, another um, core principle of Universe Control Plane, we want to make it very familiar to Docker users. Like I said before, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And so we want to make sure that we, it's familiar when users come. If you're used to using Docker Run or Docker Service, it's going to be very familiar when you come to Universal Control Plane. So here we're going to set a service name. We'll name it Demo. We're going to pass an image. If you're used to Docker, um, this is going to be very familiar, a lot of these fields. Um, However, there's some, there's some new things here. So as mentioned in the keynote, and you probably heard it a few times uh, in the last day and a half, um, there's different modes now. So we, have a, a, we can use a replicated mode for this service, which says, run these in number of replicas um, across my infrastructure, and I want it to be elastic. I want to be able to tell how deep and how far I want it to go and uh, react and, and handle and, and leverage the scheduler. There's also a global service, which says, I want this thing to run on every node. And this is very powerful. We'll see this in a, in a demo a little bit later. Um, but the, the, these are very nice for things like loggers or any other type of like host-specific things that you need to make sure it runs everywhere. No longer do you have to worry about, I'm going to pin or, or, or change the affinity so that it launches on every single one of these with, with a crazy number of, of scripts. You can just say, make sure this is global. And any time you launch a new node, um, it will automatically schedule this uh, to, to the new one and make sure that it stays running. That's another important thing. So this demo, I'm going to tell the number of replicas. Now, replicas is the, the number of instances that are running for that service. So this, this gets um, into play when you're, using, like, uh, when you're using replicated services, but it really depends on your application architecture. Um, a really cool thing of 112 is it gives you these knobs uh, to, to tweak depending on your needs. So for this case, um, I'm going to use a web application. This is a demo one, but uh, indulge me here. I want to make sure that it's highly available, and I want to be able to do some, some various uh, rolling update things here in a second. So these knobs give you the ability to control exactly how this is, this is done in your infrastructure. The stop grace period tells me when you start doing these operations of deploying these out, when you stop to, say, go to a new version, you need to, you, this allows you to specify the amount of time, the duration between each one of those operations. So for here, I'm going to say I'm going to give it one. My container stops pretty fast. Parallelism allows you to control how many uh, tasks in parallel run. So um, I'm just going to leave it at one for now. And then the update delay is how, what's the duration between the updates that we're going to allow to wait. And this is very important. Um, in my application, it starts up very quickly and it's ready to, to serve. However, if you have something that, that doesn't start up as quickly, if it needs to run some type of um, you know, other, other uh, components in the service, you can change this um, to delay a little bit so it allows the, it gives it time to start in these. And you don't have to worry about a thundering herd scenario where all of a sudden you've, you've updated these new things and you get a whole bunch of traffic, but the app really isn't ready to go yet. So for this, we're going to put it at two. Now, another um, cool feature we saw yesterday, we, we get asked all the time, is load balancing. Can, can you please do load balancing for us? What this does, Universal Control Plane leverages the new built-in load balancing uh, for Docker 1.12. And once again, it ties back, and it's very, very simple. All we do is we tell it what type of publish port, or, or the, the, the port we want to publish, and the protocol. And that's it. We hand that back to the scheduler, and the scheduler takes care of it. If you, if you saw the keynote yesterday, you, you know that what this actually does on the covers is on the nodes, it allocates a port across all of your nodes. 
Now this is, um, it's nice because you can say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dedicate um, so many instances, so many nodes of my cluster to be my load balancing nodes. And then you can set like a first tier load balancer such as an Azure load balancer, ELB, F5, to, to talk to those hosts, those known hosts, right? They're, they're host aware, but pass it back to our routing mesh, which is container aware. And this, you can hit any node in the cluster and it will automatically route it to the proper service, um, whatever you publish. And um, similar to what we have in Docker, I'm just going to add um, an environment variable uh, for my application. So if I deploy this, we can watch in universal control plane and watch as the tasks, it's, it's declared a state that I want, I've declared a state that I want this application to run in. And what it's now doing is it's gonna go back to the cluster and it's gonna say, okay, this is what it should be. I'm gonna go and I wanna make sure that these tasks are actually launched and I wanna make sure that wherever these are sitting, um, that it's actually brought up. And as long as the conference network plays nice, you should come back. That's an important thing to know is um, in, with UCP, um, uh, we're, we're just passing it back to the scheduler. So we're not doing anything special here. Um, we're merely declaring a state and letting the cluster reconcile. So these two instances are, these two tasks are back up. We can now check um, using our published port, we can see what, what uh, port allocated, uh, what the routing mesh allocated for us. And if we open this, we should see an application. So you can see it. So this is a very simple demo application. What we have here is on the left, we have the number of containers and we have uh, the current backend that it's serving. On the right, we have the actual tasks that are running. And you can see kind of the labels going back and forth. That is actually, the application is just merely requesting. It's just in a request loop that is just, that is hitting the, the back end. And this shows the built-in load balancing. So it's handling going back and forth between these two uh, instances. And you'll notice towards the bottom, there's a current version. We'll, we'll need that in just a second. So this is great. I can now declare a service. I can declare what I want this to be, how I want it to run, how I want it to update. Um, but now we need scaling. Right? It's, it's nice to be able to declare something, but we want to be able to react uh, in, the, in the event of a network fail or a hardware fail um, or, or, or just increased uh, traffic. For that, we can leverage uh, 112 again. So we can go into the service. And using uh, UCP, we make it, uh, once again, very familiar. You can edit right in here. So we're going to say we're going to just edit and change the scale to be six. So we can scroll to the task, we can see that we've now updated the declaration we want this service to be in, and um, the cluster is going to go through and actually start spinning these up. Now, um, each one of these tasks um, will be scheduled. It may not be, you know, we're, we're, we defer to uh, the, the swarm scheduling. So here we have a couple of different instances that it's, that it's on. However, um, we're gonna leverage the default to just say spread these out over my infrastructure. And as these start to go out, um, we'll see the, the load balancer will automatically um, assign these and register them into routing mesh, and you'll start rotating these into the load balancer. So if we look at the application now, we can see that it's actually scaled it up, and we now have all six instances um, deployed out, and it's load balancing through all of these. And I noticed I didn't have to touch anything. I didn't have to worry about any outside load balancer. I didn't have to manually wait and, and switch things or use my scripts to make sure the containers are up before they're actually serving. It's all doing this um, all with the routing mesh. So great, um, I've deployed an application um, and I've, I've, I have the ability now to scale it. Well, what happens when I do a deploy? So a lot of us, have different needs for what we want to do with, with deployments. Um, we probably have our own methods where we're, do, we're pulling a new image, we then deploy it, and we make sure it, or maybe we have some health checks and then we want to rotate it out. Um, you have to worry about allocating ports and then we have to shift across the workloads. With the new rolling update feature in Swarm, um, we, can, we can take that, we can take advantage of that. So as I mentioned earlier, we have some, some update policies on this. So we're gonna now go ahead and we're gonna um, deploy a new version. So here I'm just gonna change the image right into declaration. I didn't have to do any you know, type of um, rerunning or recreation. Um, all I'm doing is just updating the declaration that I have. And I'm gonna add an environment variable. And deploy. 
So now if we watch in the tasks down here, we can see that it's already starting to reconcile. So it's, it's getting the new image, it's now taking that, it's reconciling it, it's deploying it to a new cluster, or to a new uh, instance, and then it's going through the same process. So it's making sure that it's up, it's going to register with load balancer, um, register it in the mesh, and then when we rotate it through, we can look at our application and we can see that it's starting to, to rotate into, um, into this from the application. And as it goes through its deployment loop, it's going to pull it through and you'll see it going back and forth between the versions. Once it gets fully, uh, fully deployed, then it stops rotating through because the deployment actually succeeded and um, then you have successfully did a rolling update. Uh, I don't know who has tried to do this in production. This isn't a really easy task to do. Uh, so this is a, bi this is a big deal. Um, and we're really excited about it because we can you know, not only leverage it for our users, um, we can also leverage it internally if we try to do updates between our own stuff. Okay. So great, we have scalability um, and we have um, you know, security and access control. And we wanna move on to, to the monitoring side. So the first, probably one of the first things you want to do um, if, you, if you don't do it before deploying your applications is deploying or having the ability to, to have visibility into the actual applications. Um, so deploying vote apps are great, um, but it's, it's a very simple application. So what I'm going to show now is how to take this into practice and leverage all of the new, or, or most of the new features in 112, as well as with, with UCP. So we're gonna deploy an application. Um, I'm gonna go over here just for the sake of not watching me type. I'm gonna run these, all it's doing is do, deploying these services. And this is the application we're gonna deploy. So, this is comprised of two networks. So we're leveraging the overlays. It's, a, it's an important thing to know. If anyone's used overlay networking prior to Docker 112, you notice it's, it's not exactly the, most, uh, the easiest thing. You have to worry about um, KV stores and, and distributed um, external key value stores. Now in 112, it's all integrated. So out of the box, when you create it, you automatically get these overlay networks. So here I'm leveraging two. I have a backend network, which is for these backend um, forwarding services for my, for my stats. And then I have a front-end network that I'm going to use for visibility into this. We're deploying, basically, it's a metrics platform or a stats platform to see visibility into your, into your cluster. On, um, in the bottom, we have the, the, the global service. So we're going to leverage um, the new global service that says on every instance, make sure this runs, on every node, make sure this, this service runs. It's a very simple, app, uh, very simple application that just does nothing but forward uh, stats to, um, to this collector. Now an important thing to know, there is no magic going on here. This is using the, the stats API that is available in uh, Docker Remote API today. We're not bind mounting any, any root file systems. We're not using any privileged type of containers. Um, we're not doing any, anything crazy there. We're using just the remote API to where we can, we can access this. What then does is it pushes to uh, an InfluxDB. For those that don't know InfluxDB, this is a terrific time series database um, that you can store um, any type of, it's really good for storing metrics data and stats data. So those, it's going to be the receiver. So the, the global service is going to push to this collector. And then Chronograph, also another project by uh, the InfluxDB team, is a visualizer that lets us view those stats. So that's sitting on the front end network and you're segregating both of, of the back end services with the front end. So, so you, these can't talk to each other, you have network isolation. So let's go and look at these now. Maybe. I think the network is, yep, the network died on me. <laughs> I didn't, I should have, yeah, I should have drank something. Yep, I'm getting DNS resolution error, so you'll have to trust me on this one. Please, uh, Come to the booth. I will happily get this working and show you. Um, but what, we, what the result is, is this just shows kind of the power. Um, as you could see, hopefully you'll come visit afterwards and we can see what this is. But this deploys actually, it's, it's leveraging all of the features. So you have the, the overlay networking. You have, um, it's using load balancing. And it's using uh, the global services as well as the built-in DNS service discovery to find and locate these services to go across. So with that, um, I want to give a tremendous amount of thanks to all of the, the CAS team and the entire Docker team because we wouldn't be able to build this without them. Um, please come visit at the booth. We'll be here for questions, um, and we'll, we'll hang around afterwards. So thank you. We've got a couple minutes, so. I'm, I'm going to also work to get this working, so. Right. So if you have any questions, there's a pair of microphones on both sides. Uh, we'll start there. So is UCP open source? I know that Docker traditionally has been an open project. 
Um, but is UCP itself open source? And I'll tell you the second part of the question is, and why I'm asking, is because we would like to build a set of tools on top of that to you know, customize integration into our environment. We're a very large company. So we'd like to essentially be able to customize the APIs and build tools that use the APIs that are, are hopefully exposed by UCP. Yeah, so I, I can take that. So uh, UCP itself is not open source. It sits on top of the Swarm, the Swarm engine, which is itself open source. But the UCP platform itself isn't. However, to your second part of your question, we're actually working on building a plugin infrastructure with the UCP. So you can customize it to fit your own needs. So that's something that we are working on. If that's something you'd like to talk about, I'd love to hear the use case more one-on-one -on -one so we can talk about it sure. as well. Actually, Thank you. The next talk at 1.30 uh, talks about Docker plugins and the API. So if you're interested in that, uh, that'd be a great talk. It's yeah. at 1.30. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, I have two questions. First question is regarding the configuration management. I saw there's a configuration management portal in that UDP. Mm -hmm. So just wondering how you manage it in different environment. So my second question regarding the priority. So suppose I have two global service, A and B, but I want to make sure A is always deployed before B. How UDP handle it? So let me take that first one. The, if I understand the questions about how do you handle configuration management in different environments. Right. Uh, so that could mean a couple of different things. We have worked with a couple of different configuration management providers, so folks like Chef and Puppet. Uh, there are scripts that you can use to set up your UCP environment. Uh, so you can do a, do a Chef script that gets you several VMs set up in AWS, for example, and run UCP across that. Uh, there's a bunch of different scripts out there that do the same thing. So depending on the environment you're running, there's probably a script that suits your needs. And depending on which platform you actually use, do you guys use Chef Puppet? Use or do you use some other platform? No, no, uh, we we haven't used anything like that. Okay, yeah. well, the, so yeah, so there's a couple of different uh, configuration management providers within the ecosystem that we we work with. There's a lot of others just building plugin or building scripts based on UCP. Okay. Uh, so take a look and see what fits your needs. And sorry, I, the second question is sort of. Uh, would you mind repeating it, please? Uh, second question is more like a priority. Like you said, uh, when I deploy service, there are two global services, A and B. But I want to make sure A is always deployed before we deploy B. So, so how do you guys? Yeah, so that's a scheduler question. Evan, you want to you take I'm, that one? I'm sorry, can you repeat uh, the question? The question was if you have two services and you want to set a priority order around which is deployed first. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, so the, the new scheduling is still in its infancy. So we will have, I, I imagine we'll have the same type of constraints that you have with Swarm today. Um, so it's, it's still being developed out. OK, I see. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Uh, next one from over there. Oh, yeah, I'm a data center customer. Good stuff. Um, can we buy security scanning eventually for on-prem? Yes. Is that, is it, you think it'll be a separate thing or just come with the UCP? Uh, I mean, so the pay, that's still pay. being figured out. Cool, uh, to be honest, I don't, know, I don't awesome. know the details on that yet. But yes, uh, on-prem scanning is a goal for us. Um, is there already some kind of auto scaling instead of scaling manually from two to ten containers? Yeah, so that's something we're looking into as well. There's sort of two different ways to auto scale. One is container auto scaling. So on your existing cluster, can you increase the number of containers in order to meet whatever load you have? Uh, and the second is node auto scaling. Say you're in AWS and you want to scale up, add a bunch of extra nodes to meet capacity. So that's not there in the platform right now. We're still a bit in infancy. But to give you a sneak peek of how that might look, if you watched the keynote demo yesterday that showed the Docker for AWS package and how that sort of allows you to build in new nodes, that's something you, if you imagine we could take that and extend that into UCP, so you could run in an AWS environment or a GC environment and automatically auto scale up new nodes, it is something we're working on. Yes. All right. Thank you. So I've noticed in some of the uh, Swarm demonstrations when a node gets taken offline and then reintroduced, containers aren't migrated back over. Is there any plan to have load balance come across the individual nodes with the containers, or is it always just going to be trying to reach that state of six replicated containers? Yeah, when, when you define the state of where you want it, um, all the scheduler does is ensure that that's actually met. So depending on where, uh, where they actually get shifted to, um, by default, it tries to spread them, but it may, it may not get there. Um, so I, it sounds like kind of what you want to maybe rebalance, like to be able to rebalance them across. Yeah. Uh, I think it's definitely a valid feature. Um, you know, we, we should bring it up uh, to the team, because you definitely don't want to shift it too much and get it you know, to, uh, on one node. So yeah, I think a rebalance would, would, 
would definitely make sense. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Is there questions over on that side? Yeah, I had a question. Um, when you're doing a rolling update, is it possible to revoke the old images and like when the first new image version comes up, that, that one's available, the load balancer? So, so that I saw when you when it was doing the rolling update, it was simultaneously hosting both uh, oh, yes. app versions. Yeah, so I think um, what, what we're planning to do is leverage a lot of the, the new health checks in the image to be right. able to say, where, where's this? So I think we'll start having more knobs to control like when it's exactly allowed to serve mm -hmm. versus like instead of, a, instead of a rolling multi go, you can just say, all right, once these are all good, now just switch. Right, right. Yep. right. Like have the health check check app version. Yeah, I, th I think that makes sense. Yeah, being able to have a knob like that, that okay. would make sense. Uh, Take one at a time from each, so why don't you go ahead first? So uh, there's been a lot of talk about um, Azure and Amazon. Um, you know, we've done, as a company, some investigations as to the cost based upon the quality of service of the various hosting providers. And we found that Google is actually a lot cheaper than both of them. And <laughs> there's really been very little mention of Google at all. Is it just a matter of, you guys view them as a sort of competitive, a competitor, or you know, what's the level of integration for Google for this product? Um, so Docker Data Center will run on top of Google, uh, Google Cloud Platform, but in terms of the announcements that you've seen, I mean, it's generally it's, we just respond to what customers are asking us for, and that's not to say that there aren't necessarily plans to do Google, uh, but those were the two platforms, AWS and Azure, that people really wanted us to go after first. So, we send our resources that way. I mean, we are till, still technically a startup, so it's really a matter of where we're able to, to build integrations. But we're, you know, we're totally open to that conversation. So there's no like religious wars going on behind the scenes or anything like that? <laughs> not, not that I know of. <laughs> Let's take one over there. Uh, yeah, my question with the rolling upgrades, is it possible to leave both versions uh, deployed for like canary deployment, so you just like leave the new version on a few containers and the old version on the rest? Yeah, and I, actually if the, if the demo would have worked, um, we would have seen that uh, UCP actually maintains, well, th so um, the engine uh, maintains the, the task's history. So you can see the old versions there. Um, we don't have it active to where you can roll back yet. Um, but yes, you can see exactly what happened um, through the life cycle of the deployment. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something we're looking into to allow the rollbacks to say, let's bring that back um, as a recovery or, or, or a, you know, a rollback operation. Thank you. Yeah. Take one over there. All right, so this might be something that I missed. Um, I know in DTR you can define organizations and then teams and, and users. Does UCP also have an organization level Capability. So today it, it, does, it has a single org, and that's okay. if you look at the, it's called the Docker Data Center org when you look at uh, DTR. But yeah, it's something that we're looking at for, okay. for the future, being able to build multiple orgs. Okay, so you so have true, uh, you know, true horizontal scalability. So is the recommended implementation right now, if you've got multiple organizations, just spin up another UCP? That's right. So it's okay. like you can imagine you have different UCP clusters, because sure. UCP right now spins up a single cluster as part of the UCP instance. So you could have different clusters for different sort of organizations, but that is something we're looking to build in the future. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So yeah, could you talk a little bit about the pricing? I saw it was 150 per Docker engine. Does that include uh, the workers and the managers? Sorry, can you to repeat the question? The, the pricing for the data center? Pricing. Yeah, so I think it's, it's up on Docker store right now. I believe it's, it's 150 per node is what, per month is what it says on Docker data center store right now, right? And so that includes, that per node, so that means per worker and per controller, right? So each individual node that you're using running either UCP or DTR, uh, and those, you know, if you're running five replicas, for example, of DTR, that's five nodes, plus then the workers. For UCP, if you're running, say, three controllers and three nodes, uh, three worker nodes, and that would be six nodes for the UCP package. But not the, not, it's not priced for the underlying swarm that they're controlling. Thing. So UCP sits directly on top of Swarm. So we're pricing just based on the number of nodes you use, whether you're running however many instances, or how many more clusters of Swarm you're running, however many DTR registries you're running. It's just dependent on the number of nodes you actually use. OK. I get, just, is it just for what you're running, the Swarm you're running the data center applications on, or is it also the Swarm that you're running your your actual business on? 
Oh, I see. so there's like the open source set of swarm tools. You might be running an open source swarm cluster, but this is for whatever you want supported. So we have two options for a business critical and a same and a same business day style support. So whatever's your supported operation, that could be in production, it could be a test dev cluster. But if you want a supported UCP and DTR based cluster as opposed to just open source swarm, then that's what you're paying for with those per node pricing. Okay. And Thank I'm happy you. to talk more offline too, uh, if that's sure. confusing. Uh, I have two questions. So for the CS engine, when does the 112 version come out? And also, when does this new UCP version come out? And also, regarding about you know, the Docker services thing, let's say I have a QA environment where I have multiple services that I want to deploy, and they all want to use port 80. Do I need to use the external load balancer to do that, or will this new load balancer inside of uh, UCP take care of that? So I'll start with the first one, and I'll pass the second one off to, uh, actually, you wanted to say the second one first. <laughs> yeah, uh, so right now, the, the current load balancing model is TCP only, um, mm -hmm. but we're, le we're looking to get more options as far as like handling HTTP traffic like you would do with host headers and so on and so forth. So right now, you would need to have an external if you need to do HTTP level uh, load balancing. But I'm happy to talk to you afterwards in yeah. uh, okay. more detail. And as for the first part of the question, so I can't give you release dates right now, but if the new 1.12 is currently in RC, so that'll go into GA. Once that goes into GA, it follows a sort of standard procedure. Uh, several weeks after that is when the CS engine comes out to make sure everything is bug-free and running in a, a production-level sure. environment. And then we'll run UCP-based off of that. OK, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Is there a mechanism where um, uh, there are shared uh, variables between the dependent services, <clears throat> like sandbox variables I can use from one container to another container. Do you have an example of what you mean by a sandbox variable? Um, uh, let's say like uh, one of my containers uh, creates some variables and I want to induce them into the other container that comes up dependent on the first one. So like, do you mean like sidecar containers, like being able to run several containers that are dependent on each other so they have to run on the same node? Yeah, maybe or? the first one actually creates some uh, text or uh, kind of any security key that uh, has to be shared with the uh, the, uh, the rest of the ones that come after the first one. Mm, yeah, I, I, let's let's talk afterwards. Uh, I think it's a that's a that's a, a complex use case. Sure. Uh, so let, let's yeah, if you would say after we can, we can talk through that some more. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, uh, I just wanted to know if for the rolling update you are planning to have a rollback situation if something goes wrong. Yeah, we're we're looking into that. That's a common request asked. Um, so we're looking to do rollbacks. We have, like I um, I mentioned, we have the the historical tasks that have all been done uh, for that service. We have the full life cycle of it, so we can we can see exactly where actions have happened. Um, and that's what we're being yeah we're being asked. We're looking at that feature to to uh, add rollback to each you know to each stage if you want. Yep. Yeah, I'll reemphasize that what we're showing here is all prototype and production work. So we're definitely building additional features on top of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more over there. Uh, good job on the progress so far. Lots of improvements Thank you. in uh, DDC. Thank you. Um, question I had was, you, I know it's part of the demo, but I wanted to see some of the DNS facilities that are new in Engine and, and DDC. Yeah, so actually what, what the demo is actually running on the bottom um, uses all the DNS-based SD. So in the diagram, we had the back ends, um, the stats that we're talking to the front. Actually, you can refer, uh, you can, if, if you're attached to that network, you can refer to just the service name. So in all of the little workers down there, I just refer to influx. And it automatically queries the local, it has its local resolver um, that, that resolves that service to the name. Um, and then it's the same on top. So I just refer to there. So it's using that internal service discovery that is, um, it uses the service name to add those. Um, there's a couple new features that are like SRV records and things like that. Um, and I'd be happy to, to go in more detail if you, if you have questions. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, one more. Uh, so in your, all, all of your demos, you've manually scaled. In production, nobody manually scales. Uh, so are you planning to add to, uh, some capability for dynamic scaling, especially at the microservice level, that sort of thing? Yeah, so I think we were talking a little bit earlier about auto-scaling, uh, both on a container and a node level. We are looking to do both in the future, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, one more over there. Uh, two questions. One is um, when you de define your container nodes, is there a place you can actually also define the CPU uh, resource, basically capacity, you know, allocation, how many memory this I want to give this application? Is that defined in there? I want to limit memory usage, CPU usage for yeah. this particular image. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, right now, as Vivek said, this is, a, this is a preview of what we're building. We don't have all the things added yet, um, but I believe we have reservations under in Swarm. And since we're built on top of Swarm, like we'll support whatever whatever Swarm mode has. So if you if we have reservation based or constraint based, where you can specify, actually you can specify that. We just need to get it in. So. Okay. The second way is, uh, I think the other gentleman also talked about troubleshooting. Um, my daily run, I run into problems like when the pulling image takes too long and time out, and sometimes system crash and uh, the container cannot be restarted because the name conflict. And so all these cleanup thing, uh, if I have a problems and in this platform, how do I go about for troubleshooting? Yeah, so um, like I said, we, we maintain all the history of the tasks. Each task you can actually drill into and see exactly what it's running. And those are uniquely identified, so they can help you. You don't have to worry about the conflicts. And if, there's a, if they're in UCB, you can see what the status is. So if there is, you know, if, it's, if it has an error, you can drill into it. You can see the logs. You can figure out exactly what you need for that task uh, to help you troubleshoot through. And then what do I do? Do I can I re manually remove a image or something like oh, that? Oh, right. So um, what the cluster will do is, if there is an error, the cluster will reconcile that. So if there's if there's a task that fails on a node because it can't pull an image, it will try to reschedule that to another node and recover for you. Um, and if it, it it will keep trying until it, it actually meets the the declaration that that is of the service. And just to add to that, Swarm allows you to set policies around how you handle these kind of failures, so you can customize it for your environment. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, I all think right. that's all the questions. Any more questions? No. Uh, round of applause. Thank you, Evan. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be here. Feel free to come up if you want to talk. <laughs>